Hello everyone, I'm Emma Whipday. Welcome to At Home with Austin for A Bit Lit. This series is an exploration of the significance of the home and household relationships in Jane Austen's novels, from me in my home, perhaps to you in yours. And today I'm going to be focusing on a household relationship at the centre of Austen's novel Sense and Sensibility, and that's the relationship between two sisters. And I'm going to be suggesting that even though this novel ends with the traditional Austen happily ever after, where the heroines marry, in fact, it's the love story between these sisters that's the centre of the novel and that's most significant at the end, particularly in relation to how these sisters' affection for each other helps them to grow and develop in relation to each other. But before we get started, I'm going to remove my bonnet because this is at home with Austen and women in Austen's period didn't wear their bonnet indoors. Now I'm going to start by thinking about Sense and Sensibility in a slightly unexpected context in relation to the Disney film Frozen and the relationship between the central heroines, Anna and her sister Elsa. Now in some ways Frozen sets itself up like a traditional fairy tale. Elsa's powers run away with her and she accidentally causes her sister to be turned into ice and the hope is that Anna will be able to be rescued from this fate by True Love's Kiss, which the film hints will be from Kristoff, the man who's become the lo unexpected love interest of Anna. However, when he attempts to save her, he isn't able to do so. yourself for me I love you an act of true love will thaw a frozen heart love will thaw love the only thing that in the end is shown to be able to reverse the spell as a sign of true love is her sister Elsa's embrace so at the center of this Disney film is quite a radical message that actually true love is not found by finding your love interest and eventually marrying him, but exists already in the relationship between the sisters. I want to suggest that something equally radical is going on a couple of hundred years earlier in Jane Austen's novel Sense and Sensibility. As I imagine anyone who's familiar with the novel or who's seen the wonderful Emma Thompson adapted film um, in which she also played Eleanor will know. The two sisters represent the two different aspects of the title. Eleanor seems to stand for sense and Marianne seems to stand for sensibility. And in some ways the novel suggests that sense is the right path to follow, although I'm going to complicate this a little bit by the end of this video. And I want to start by talking about this novel in relation to that ending of Frozen by focusing on a particular phrase that Marianne says to Eleanor near the end of the novel. This is the point where a lot of the plot has already happened. Marianne has been betrayed by Willoughby after believing him to be her true love and has grown ill from heartbreak and nearly died. But when she recovers, she begins to regret her reckless behaviour and disregard for her own life and the suffering that she's caused her sister. And she looks back on her actions with pain and hopes that Willoughby is similarly feeling pain for his actions. She says to Eleanor, I am not wishing him too much good when I wish his secret reflections may be no more unpleasant than my own. He will suffer enough in them. Eleanor, surprised, says, do you compare your conduct with his? And keep in mind here that Willoughby has 
run away with a vulnerable young woman, which is why he couldn't marry Marianne, and has left her pregnant and without friends or help and in, in disgrace. And when this is found out, he's disinherited and therefore marries a rich woman, which is what prevents his marriage to Marianne. So when Eleanor's saying, do you compare your conduct with his? She's suggesting that Marianne's conduct really hasn't been very bad at all in comparison. But Marianne responds, no, I compare it with what it ought to have been. I compare it with yours. And this is the sentence that I'm suggesting is at the centre of the novel. The idea that near the end of the novel, Marianne reaches a realisation that her sister had been the right guide for her all along. That if she tried to behave as her sister had, much of her pain could have been avoided. And I want to look a bit further at this by thinking about the phrase that Marianne uses. I compare it with what it ought to have been. Because this is a phrase that recurs at a few key points throughout the novel, and I think Austen's using it to make us think about what we think conduct of the characters ought to have been. What are the morals, that, the frameworks that we should be judging the characters by? The first time it pops up is soon after Marianne has for the first time had a full conversation with Willoughby, the man she's falling in love with. And she's been very open about how interesting she finds him, about how exciting she finds it that they have so many books in common and interests and opinions in common. And afterwards, Eleanor rebukes her, because in this period, women are supposed to be reserved and cautious until they are certain that a man is in love with them. They're not supposed to show their love first. And Marianne, when she's been rebuked, says, Eleanor, is this fair? Is this just? But I see what you mean. I have been too much at my ease, too happy, too frank. I have erred against every commonplace notion of decorum. I have been open and sincere when I ought to have been reserved, spiritless, dull and deceitful. Had I talked only of the weather and the roads, and had I spoken only once in ten minutes, this reproach would have been spared. So Marianne's ought to have been here is an ironic one. She's saying, I ought to have been reserved, spiritless, dull and deceitful, when of course she doesn't think anything of the kind. There's an implicit criticism of Eleanor's ought to have beens there. Marianne suggesting that if she had really behaved by the strictures of society in the period, if she had allowed herself to be reserved and careful, then she would have not only been dull, been boring, but would also have been deceitful, have been lying by not showing her true nature. So we get here a real clash of moral codes. The ought to have been of Eleanor, which suggests that Marianne ought to have been careful and cautious and only polite. And Marianne's belief that she should be open, full of sensibility, full of recklessness, show her true self to Willoughby. A similar idea crops up soon later um, in, a, in a point in the novel where Eleanor discovers that the man she loves, Edward, is secretly engaged to Lucy, Lucy Steele, because Lucy tells her so. And Lucy is explaining that Edward has been at school with her uncle and that's how they met. She says, he was four years with my uncle who lives at Lomstable near Plymouth. It was there our acquaintance began, for my sister and me were often staying w with my uncle and it was there our engagement was formed, though not till a year after he had quitted as a pupil, but he was almost always with us afterwards. I was very unwilling to enter into it, as you may imagine, without the knowledge and approbation of his mother, but I was too young and loved him too well to be so prudent as I ought to have been. And again, that ought to have been is given to us with a little bit of irony there, because Lucy is not prudent as someone ought to, a woman in particular, ought to be according to the standards of this period. She's entered into a secret engagement with a man without her parents or his parents' knowledge or permission, which is quite a scandalous thing to do. But we get the sense that Lucy doesn't really regret that. She's sort of flaunting in front of Eleanor at this point the fact that she has the man that she suspects Eleanor loves, that her lack of prudence has paid off and is likely to bring her future happiness. So again, the I ought to be have been here is ironised. It's being suggested that in fact Lucy doesn't think she should have been prudent at all. So in the, at these points, we're almost being encouraged to sympathise with the passionate, reckless young women who say they won't live by society's strictures. However, later in the novel, ought to have been crops up in a very different context. And this is when Colonel Brandon, who clearly has some secret sorrow, eventually opens up about that sorrow to Eleanor and tells her about the woman he loved 
who was married to his brother against her will, and who was gradually led into a life of disgrace when she committed adultery and then was, in the words of the period, ruined. She fell from society um, and she eventually ends up dead. So Brandon says of her, My brother had no regard for her. His pleasures were not what they ought to have been, and from the first he treated her unkindly. The consequence of this, upon a mind so young, so lively, so inexperienced as Mrs Brandon's, was but too natural. Can we wonder that, with such a husband to provoke inconstancy, and without a friend to advise or restrain her, she should fall? So here, ought to have been is suddenly used in a radically different context. We're not hearing about what polite society requires of people in terms of social behaviour here. Instead, we're hearing about something much darker. His pleasure pleasures were not what they ought to have been is a euphemism standing in for who knows what. Austin invites the audience to imagine it could be gambling, it could be drink, it could be adultery, it could be seeing prostitutes. It could be anything that's beyond the pale of moral ideas in this period. So suddenly his pleasures were not that they ought to have been, suggests that really people ought to behave by a particular standard, and when this man doesn't, it leads to a young woman, his wife's disgrace, and eventually her death. And again, this sense of ought to have been as something very significant, the idea that you should behave by particular morals, as, as Eleanor does, it continues to be charged and emphasised throughout the rest of the novel. Near the end, Willoughby finally explains his actions, but he explains them not to Marianne, as we might expect, but to Eleanor, who again receives other people's confidences. And Willoughby says to Eleanor, that she hasn't heard everything about his story from Colonel Brandon, at the point where it's revealed that he has eloped with the daughter of the woman Colonel Brandon loved, so Colonel Brandon's ward, Eliza, and that he's made her pregnant and abandoned her. Remember, says Willoughby, from whom you received the account of his running away with Eliza. Could it be an impartial one? I acknowledge that her situation and her character ought to have been respected by me. Her affection for me deserved better treatment, but I have injured her more than herself, and I have injured one whose affection for me, may I say it, was scarcely less warm than hers, and whose mind, oh, how infinitely superior. So here he's talking about the woman he eloped with, and how his foolish, or not even eloped with because he didn't mean to marry her, but ran away with, and about how his desire for her and his willingness to ruin her has deprived him of the woman he really loves, Marianne. And here, when he says, I acknowledge that her situation and her character ought to have been respected by me, it's a huge understatement. He seems to be saying, you know, that is the very least he could have done. In fact, what he ought to have done is not run away with her, not ruined her, not led to her having a child. Here again, ought to have been carries a moral weight. Austin is contrasting how someone ought to behave to how Willoughby, in fact, has behaved. So there's a sense in the novel that as we go on, we gradually move from seeing the ought to have been as the strictures of society that hold back these passionate young women from being their true selves and telling people how they feel, to the sense that this oughts and these moral frameworks are really important to stop men seducing these vulnerable women and leading to their destruction. So you could argue that when we get to the point where Marianne says that she compares her conduct to what it ought to have been, I compare it with yours to Eleanor, that the novel has been entirely immoral about how Marianne's freedom and willingness to indulge her emotions and be honest about who she is and not behave by society's conventions could have led her to destruction and that she ought to be like Eleanor, that it's straightforward that sense wins out over sensibility. But I want to suggest that something slightly more complex is going on. If Marianne learns to be more like her sister, so in the end does Eleanor. She eventually admits her feelings and emotions to Edward when he proposes to her by making it clear how joyous she finds it and how overwhelmingly emotional she finds it when she learns that he hasn't married someone else. But then you... I'm not married. <laughs> 
Eleanor. <laughs> Eleanor, I met Lucy when I was very young. <laughs> had I had an active profession, I should never have felt such an idle, a foolish inclination. My behavior at Norland was very wrong. But I convinced myself that you felt any friendship for me. <laughs> and that it was my heart alone that I was risking. I've come here with no expectations. Only to profess, now that I am at liberty to do so, that my heart is and always will be yours. So it's not just that Marianne learns to restrain her emotions, but perhaps Eleanor also learns to give in to them. There's a sense that both sisters have learned to be more what they ought to have been from each other, and that that is the true moral of the narrative, I think. And I think this is borne out by the end of the book, because it ends after both women are married to the man they've ended up by loving, not with a focus on their wedded bliss, but with a focus on their sisterly bliss. So the end of the novel reads, between Barton and Delaford, where they both live, there was that constant communication which strong family affection would naturally dictate. And among the merits and the happiness of Eleanor and Marianne, let it not be ranked as the least considerable that those sisters and living almost within sight of each other, they could live without disagreement between themselves or producing coolness between their husbands. So there's a sense here that the happy ending is that even though they're sisters, they're able to live close to each other and continue to get on. So Austen isn't romanticising the sisterly relationship. She's not suggesting it's easy to be a sister. The many tensions and misunderstandings and silences between the sisters in the novel bear that out. But what she does suggest is that what's astonishing and inconsiderable, as she puts it, and important about these sisters, is that they get to the point where they're able to be honest with each other and communicate with each other and learn what they ought to be, what they ought to have been for each other. And that becomes the sisterly love story that has a happy ending at the end of Sense and Sensibility. Thank you very much for joining me today. And I really hope that you'll join me for next week when I interview journalist and Austin expert Je Deborah Yaffe about her work on the Austin fan community. Thank you. <laughs>